How's everybody doing today? Peter, how are you, man? You good? You're good? Good. I love you, man. It was really good talking to you this past Friday. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I just want to take a moment and say thank you to Pastor Matthew for inviting me to this pulpit. That's a high honor. Um, and it's nothing I take lightly. And now I'm going to be really brutally honest with you. Uh, this is how, just in case y'all didn't know how things work in the world of pastors and conversations, this is how it went. Uh, I was driving down the road, maybe this was three, maybe three and a half weeks ago, maybe four, and uh, Matthew calls me on the phone. He said, hey, man. I was like, uh-oh. He said, hey, man, I hope you're doing good today. I uh, just want to let you know me and the Board of Elders are talking. We'd like to invite you to come preach. And my initial thought, if I'm just being honest with you, is, man, now really isn't the time. I got a lot going on, man. I, I got a sick dad. I just moved a house. Like, we got stuff. Like, there's a lot going on. Uh, maybe maybe another time. I, but I gave him the Christian answer, the one that he can't refute. And I said, well, let me pray about it. <clears throat> let me talk to the Lord, see what he has to say on the subject. That was a big mistake on my end. When I began to read this scripture, the Lord just began to pour into me revelation. Here's, a, here's my honest truth uh, and belief this morning. I believe that if we can grasp what God has to say this morning, it will change the culture of this church forever. I believe that we will look back at today and see an altar. I believe we'll look back at today and see a moment that worship shifted for us in a place where we were never the same. I have the honor of bringing uh, the word from Psalm 100, which is the only psalm in all of the Bible that is titled, A Psalm for Giving Grateful Praise. But here's what I want us to do. This is five verses in total, okay? But I got to give it to you the way that the Lord gave it to me. And it's going to be a little bit unorthodox, but I'm a preacher wearing a hat. All bets are off the table. I'm, it's going to be as unorthodox as it can possibly get this morning. Thanks. He says with his hat that literally looks just like mine except for in teal. Uh, Instead of us reading this scripture today for what it is and taking it at face value, I want us to read it from a standpoint of why was it written. Not what does this psalm say, but why would the psalmist choose to use these words? Why would the psalmist choose to write a song of this nature? What does it mean? Where does it come from the heart? Because within that truth, I believe, is the reason why we worship. If we can grasp why we worship, to worship will never be an issue for us. Amen? Come on, y'all got to start talking back to me a little bit here. Here's the deal. I'll preach better the more you talk back. All right? <clears throat> All right, James. <laughs> so as we go through these scriptures today, I want you to kind of take a behind-the-music look with me at why this was written. And then we're going to kind of wrap back around to it again. We're going to break these verses down one by one. But I believe that when we get back to the, to the basis of it, you'll never be able to look at the Scripture and read it again. It's one of the reasons I love the Word of God. If I can just pause and say that for a moment. If any of you are struggling with intimacy with the Lord, get into your Word. Get into your Word. It is living. It is breathing. That I love books. I read books all the time. But I could read Lord of the Rings. I used to read Lord of the Rings, the trilogy, yearly, once every year, right? But all that I'm ever doing when I'm reading Lord of the Rings is having the same experience again. I'm enjoying the same thing again. I could read this same verse 29 times and experience something brand new and fresh every single time I read it. And my prayer for today is that first service and this service would be completely separated. I pray that the word that God has for you is fresh and is new and is full of power and is full of glory. Let's go ahead and read really quickly through the scripture and then we'll take a moment to pray. Y'all turn with me to uh, Psalm 100 if you have your Bibles. If you don't, shame on you. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, pull out your phones or whatever you have. Let me know where you got it. Somebody say there. There, cool. Thank you. Verse 1, Shout for joy to the Lord, all of the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is He that has made us. We are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. I could pause right there and preach. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving 
and into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Will you pray with me? Father, there's nothing else I have to offer to you except for to say, have your way in this place. I'm yours, use me. Whatever it is you want to do, I'm listening. Open the hearts of the people. May everything that come out of my mouth come from your throne room. May this place forever be impacted by the word of the Lord. In your name we pray, amen. Did you happen to catch the structure there as we read through this scripture? Anybody see it? Or is, am, am I just crazy? It kind of reads as if it's a way of life, okay? Verse 1 and 2 here, if it's still up on the screen, verse 1 and 2 here are, are calls to praise. Notice that he doesn't say, Dear God, I worship you. He says, Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. It is a command to do. It is a call for you to worship along with him. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him singing joyful songs. So it kind of breaks down like this. It's, it's a command and an action verse, followed by verse 3, which is a truth, or today we're going to use it for a why. It's led again by verse 4 of entering into his gates with thanksgiving, into his course with praise, followed by another truth in his closing verses. So when we're looking at it there, we can kind of see this pattern start to build upon itself of God not just calling us to worship, but God giving us a reason to. The psalmist saying, here's what we should do, and here's also why we should do it. So if we were to title today's message, which I'm not huge on, but, you know, whatever, church. So if you were to title today's message, I would title it, Why Do We Worship? And what I believe God has given us here is three really solid and applicable things. These things, let me pause here. Sorry, this is going to sound like I'm, I'm all over the place, but it's just true. I need to say this because of something that happened in first service afterwards. I had a brother come up to me and just say, man, that hit me so hard. And started talking about how, you know, he wants to change the way he, he does and, and so on. And I looked at him straight in the face and I said, it hit me hard too. This is not a word that I'm preaching to you. I had to go through this. I had to war with God over this conversation before I ever brought it to this pulpit. So please understand that every single thing that I'm bringing to you today is preaching right back to me. This microphone is a reciprocal thing that is coming right back to me. And what God was gracious enough to hand me was what I believe are three revelations as to why we worship. Now, some of you guys may not know me personally, and I don't hold that against you. I'm very hard to get a hold of. So here is just one really quick insight into the brain of David O'Neill. It's a scary place. Don't spend a lot of time there. But <clears throat> I cannot stand doing any singular thing that does not have a why behind it. Nothing. Nothing. I don't want to do it if there's not a reason to do it. Okay? The most dreaded things that my father used to say to me when I was growing up, I bet you you could say it before I do, is when he would say, make up your bed, and I say why, and he'd say, because... So what? That, all that tells me is, is who I should be listening to, right? That doesn't tell me why making up the bed matters. Now, I'm, I understand discipline, and it matters to listen to your parents. That's not what I'm trying to say. Please don't start throwing tomatoes or stones or none of that stuff just yet. I'm not really good at dodging. But what I do believe is that there are many things in this world that are pretty close to pointless that we do every day. Here's a great example. Making up your bed. It's stupid. Don't care. Run and tell whoever you want to tell. David's, look, first of all, y'all should never see my bed to begin with. That is a very private place of my life. So I don't know why I ever had to make up my bed to begin with. My mom was like, company's coming. I'm like, they ain't coming to my room. Clean the dishes. I don't know what you want me to do. I'll do the dishes. I'll mop the floor. They're not going into my bedroom. But making up the bed is pointless because I'm seeing parents turn around to kids. Oh, I've already got people in trouble this morning. She's an adult, Bill. <laughs> making up the bed makes no sense because I'm going to get back in it. And the only reason you make up something is for aesthetic. My bed does nothing by looking good. It only does what it's supposed to do if I sleep in it. 
It only does what it's supposed to do if I do what I, me and the bed are designed to do, right? So I can't stand... Uh, yeah, I just about preached a whole separate sermon there. I, I had to catch myself for a second. Ha! The Lord is good this morning. Whew! I had to catch myself. That came out in tongues. All right. <clears throat> Luckily, the psalmist does not leave us there. It says, shout for joy to the Lord, all of the earth. Uh, let me also just pause there for a moment and explain what the word all means, just in case you don't know. All means all. All means every of the thing. If you are a thing, you are a all. So when the scripture here in the psalmist says, shout for joy, all of the earth, that is applicable to you. So if you thought this morning this message wasn't going to apply to you because you're not David and you don't you know, worship expressively, unfortunately, unless you have found a way to get outside of the category of all, this is going to be applicable for you. But luckily, the psalmist nor God leaves us there. He goes on to say another doing, worship the Lord with gladness, come before him with joyful songs. That's why we put, I thank God, in the set list. That's the joys of being the worship pastor and the word bringer. Then he goes into verse 3, and this is where we're going to park our car for a little while. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that has made us. We are his, we are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Here's why we're going to park on that verse. Because I believe for some of us, because it was for me, verse 1 and 2 are difficult to do. They're hard to hold on to. Shout for joy to the Lord. I don't want to. I don't want to. Come in here singing a song of guys. I don't want to. I think the answer is found there in verse 3 as to what do we do? So what then is the answer if there is something we are meant to do? There's a way we're meant to approach God, but it's foreign from where we are. I believe it's found in this word, no. So if you're taking notes here with me, here's going to be the first reason as to why we worship. We worship because of who he is. Now, I was reading through the scripture, uh, and forgive me for reading my notes. I promise I want to connect with you, but I, sometimes you just got to give it the same way that God handed it to you. As I was reading through scriptures, this word completely broke my brain. And I'm going to do my best to hand it to you the way that the Lord revealed it to me in this powerful four-letter word that is no. Here's the thing. I am completely convinced this morning, and if you have an argument to this, feel free to send it to Matthew's email. I'd love to read it. You cannot worship what you do not know. It is not a possibility. But equally so, you will read these first two verses of the psalm and say, I don't get it. You won't understand the heart of shout for joy or to sing a song of gladness to something or someone you don't have a relationship with. So just for clarity's sake, since we're going to be talking about the word worship quite a bit here for a little while, let's break it down. I'm not going to try to tell you what it originally sounded like in the old English because that's stupid and I can't pronounce it. I'm from the sticks. Here's what I am going to tell you. <clears throat> it comes from two words, right? And they basically translate back to worth and ship. And the word ship, when we usually use that, it, it's tied around a quality or a likeness of. So when I say something like friendship, like me and Cedric have friendship, that means that he is showing to me qualities of being a friend, or he is friendly. When we say that, you know, LeBron James has good sportsmanship, I don't know if that's true, but he has good sportsmanship, right? <clears throat> what we're saying is he shows the likeness of one who is portraying to be a good sportsman. So when we say the word worship, or to worship something, that means to attach to it a level of worth or to call something altogether worthy. How can you call something worthy that you do not even know? Some of us are wondering today why worship is such a barrier for us to get past. And honestly, we could park right there and it's found. How can you worship well something you don't know well? How can you sing songs from your heart of how worthy someone is that we don't even know? How can we read what the psalmist is writing here and get the heart behind it, let alone act upon it? How can you worship if you don't know that he is Lord? Knowing that the Lord is God is half of the battle. It's true. 
Knowing who he is alone is a cause and a reason to worship. And you may not know all the characteristics of God. You may not be able to sit here and, and, and go through a whole worship leader soundtrack of he's worthy, he's righteous, he's, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But if you start at a baseline of the Lord is God, he is creator, he is the maker, it immediately points to you and having that relationship with God and a reason for us to worship and the beauty is, is that God does desire that relationship with you. He's not asking you to worship something that's foreign from you. In fact, I could argue this morning that a good portion of the reason why Jesus came to die for you has nothing to do with heaven. Nothing at all. Heaven is a, is a partial point. Uh, that's something that God could have created in several different ways, and there's a lot of theology that goes around that. But the point I'm trying to make is... The reason why I believe Jesus came and died was to set back something right that sin stole from you. And it was not heaven, it was communion. When you have an opportunity to enter into this type of relationship with God, a knowing of God, it changes the way we worship. Heads up to, I, I just say this really quickly. If you don't enjoy getting to know God here, don't think it's going to change when you get to heaven. Don't think that something's going to switch when you get there. It's not true. And and personally, there's nothing uh, attractive to me about the word eternity. My brain can't grasp it. There's nothing beautiful about alone. There's nothing beautiful about the idea of something starting and never ending, and never starting. My brain actually just breaks. It fritzes up, and I, you know, I can't do anything with that. What is interesting to me and very attractive is getting to know the Lord more and more without end, never ceasing every day until the end of nothing that never ends. That is a great and attractive thing to me. And that in and of itself is heaven. So where I got messed up in this scripture and, and where God started teaching me to read this in reverse is the word no. No. Because the word know and the word worship are tied together in more ways than I could imagine. I'm going to preach just for a little bit here about the word identity. Uh, because I believe it's a hinge point for worship as well. My daddy used to say, I meant to say this earlier, my daddy used to say that in every good teaching there's a little bit of preaching. And in every good preaching there's a little bit of teaching. This is one of those teaching moments. God created you for and to worship. So if you were designed to worship, he was designed to receive worship. That's just how it works. It is the order of the kingdom of God. Therefore, if we know that he is Lord alone, it's all we got so far. And we want to know him in a deeper way. And our identity is tied to who we know. And knowing that we were made to do this, doing the thing actually helps us know him better as we worship we actually get to know him in a more deep and intimate way here's how you can only know what you are near and worship draws us into his presence when we worship we are practicing nearness to god the book of matthew in chapter 18 verse 20 says for where two or three gather together in my name most of you know this there I am among them. But David, how does that make sense? How can God be omnipresent and also in the midst of something? I'm glad you asked, ominous voice that came from nowhere. He absolutely is. He's right here in this room. He was right there with me when I wrote this message. What worship does is it opens my heart to receive that truth. It does not change what's always been true. It changes me. It makes me become aware of his presence and therefore aware of his nature and therefore aware of his goodness and able to see him for who he is, which in turn makes me worship him all the more. The Bible says this really cool thing about praise. It says he inhabits the praises of his people, meaning he dwells within it. He looks to live there. He finds it comfortable to be in your worship. So if you're struggling this morning with how you feel about God, how you view God outside of him being Lord that we see there in verse 3, and I promise I'm going to wrap these things back together, 
But can I just encourage you for a moment to say, if you're struggling with how you know God, try worship. Try worship. I, uh, I'm, I'm young in marriage. I don't, how long have we been married? You don't know either. Six, uh, some, we've been married for some time, a span of time. <clears throat> Around about something. Um, but I've known Jenna my entire life. I've known her since I was three years old. We've had times where we weren't really in each other's life and times where she was running after me and pursuing me and I was just like, I don't have time. I really appreciate that, but I'm just, just let God, if he leads me. Anybody that knows us knows that is not true. <laughs> I started doing something in our, in our disagreements and it's, it's worked flawlessly. You know why? I didn't say this first service. You know why it works flawlessly? Because God's principles work in every situation that there is of life. If you apply God into any situation, it will work. And what I've done is when she has said something or if I have done something wrong, it's, all, it's usually me, I did. Um, when I've done something that is not okay and we are frustrated with one another, I get away from her and I begin to audibly speak out loud things that I know to be true about her. Listen to me, church. Hear what I'm trying to say this morning. When I audibly do that, it immediately shifts me out of feeling into a place of truth. I might be mad because she doesn't shut the cabinet doors or because I don't put down the toilet seat or leave it up. I really don't ever know which one's the right way. I just try. Peeing is scary. It's a scary event. Whatever the level of frustration is doesn't matter because I can be, I can get really, my flesh can get really there really fast. And immediately I can let my feelings rise above the truth of who I know Jenna to be intimately. And so when I start to say, no, Jenna is kind, Jenna is for me, Jenna has decided to tie her life with mine. She vowed to me to be faithful and true and to walk with me. She vowed to wake up to my ugly mug every single day that ends with why until we both leave this earth. Immediately, that feeling of frustration is switched into gratitude. And before you know it, I'm walking back in the house praising again. Jenna, you're good. I really appreciate the way that you do X, Y, and Z. Thank you so much for being the wife that you are. And I love you. But that is, <clears throat> that wasn't that. That just, I just that just came out, so I just said it. I almost said the other thing, but I don't want to say that with a microphone in my hand. We pregnant, y'all. <clears throat> We pregnant as we can possibly be. There's a whole word in that in and of itself that I ain't got time to preach of God's faithfulness, but maybe one day I'll be invited back. We'll see how this goes. The mystery of worship is that when I do it, when I sing these songs or I say these words or I quote the scripture, whether I'm in the right heart to believe it or not, whether I'm living in frustration or not, it shifts the current atmosphere that I'm in to one of truth. And all of a sudden I'm aware of God and I'm able to access his presence and his goodness. I am able to know him and to know him is to worship him. And we enter into this crazy but beautiful cycle of worshiping him solely because he is Lord, which also allows me deeper into his presence. And as I go deeper to his presence, I learn more about him, which makes me want to worship him all the more. I don't think y'all getting this this morning. So when the psalmist says, know that the Lord is God, he is saying to know him is reason alone to worship him. But what is great about our God is that as we know him, we get to worship him more and the worshiping helps us to get to know him. That's just brilliant to me. It's absolutely brilliant. So when the psalmist goes back, in, in, when we're going back through verse 1 and he says, shout to the Lord. Why? Because you know that the Lord is God. And by worshiping, we have a doorway to get to know him deeper and to know the reason to worship is him all by itself. But there's also another reason to know him. And I get to find those characteristics as I go deeper with him. So therefore, the doing and the why become synonymous with the word no. Know that he is God, and because he is, you should worship. And when you worship, you will know him. I don't know about you, but that's just, that's such a God thing to set up. I could have never, I could have never wrote something so clever or create such a system that's so beautiful that the intimacy that I wish for you to have with me 
is an option laid on the table that you will initially walk through in obedience. But as you walk through in obedience, you'll get to know me more and more. And as you get to know me more and more, you'll want to worship me more and more. And as you want to worship me more and more, you'll get to know me more and more. And so on and so on. And this eternity of this love affair with God just begins to break out. And y'all wonder why I get a microphone up here on Sunday mornings and act a little unbecoming. I can't help it. I don't know how you can help it. This thing is so beautiful and so big and so much larger than us. It's something only God could manifest, only God could create. It's nothing I would have thought of my own free will. And when we do that, when we know him, verse 1 and 2 become culture to us. How can I shout for joy? How can I worship the Lord with gladness? How can I come before him with a joyful song? Because I know him. And we worship him because of who he is. Let me move on before I cut into y'all's lunchtime. I know how y'all get when you're hungry. <clears throat> Lord, bless me. Touch me, Jesus. Verse 3 says, Know that the Lord is God. It is he that has made us and we are his we are his people the sheep of his pasture point two you ready to write this down we worship because of who we are the word says that we are sheep of his pasture I don't know about you but to be his people is a reason enough for me to worship but here's the other thing. Worship is the established culture of the kingdom of heaven. It is part of how God's kingdom operates. Another thing, if you're not too fond of worship, heaven's not going to be too fun for you. You follow me? You with me? Somebody say yes. Somebody let me know you're still in the room. You're still awake. All right. Worship is the culture of heaven. But David, how come I don't see that in our local assembly? Because the culture of heaven and the culture of America are very different. Worship is the culture of heaven. Comfort is the culture of America. And the problem is we have allowed as believers, now I'm going to preach for a few moments, we have allowed as believers the culture of America to make its way into the culture of kingdom. How many times have you heard a worship pastor say, if you're comfortable? If you guys are comfortable, go ahead and start raising your hands. And work. Uh, If you're comfortable, say this. If you're comfortable, find me one place in the scripture where it says, if you are comfortable. Or does it instead say, shout to the Lord for joy, all of the earth enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise because we are his people sorry I lost my place here we are his people we are the sheep of his pasture and here's the deal about worship whether it's, it's done in comfort or not, it's a, it's a hard thing to remember that worship is what you were made to do. You were created to point back to the glorious nature of your creator. That is your sole purpose. I have proof here I'm going to bring to you in just a second, but I want to say this one other thing here, and that is uh, you don't have to look like me or sound like me when I worship and when I praise because I don't look and sound like the next man. But let me make something very clear. This word worship is oftentimes synonymous with the word praise, and praise is something that you must do. You cannot praise in your heart. I wish it was that way. I wish it was. I wish that Bill would know how much he means to me if I don't tell him. But he doesn't. And what I found, I'm just going to use you. I'm looking at you, so just go walk with me. Walk with me. <clears throat> what I have found is, is I can hinder our relationship because I begin to think things that are untrue about the way Bill sees me 
based on the way that we're able to communicate with each other. And all that it takes to remove that veil from that relationship and that hardship that the enemies try to put on it is a level of praise. Me looking back at that and say, Bill, I just want to say thank you for who you've been to me and my wife and my family. You matter to us. Your voice matters to us. And if today were to be the last day that I see you, I hope you know that. Same thing with the Spirit of God. It ain't got to look like the way that I do it. You ain't got to get up here and do it the way I do it, but you do got to do something. You do got to do something. I love this story that happens here. I might go over time. Y'all going to be all right. I know this. I like this story that happens here in Luke. It, it's one of my favorite stories because I just love sometimes when Jesus uh, talks like people don't think Jesus talks. It's one of my favorite things in the world. Jesus was not uh, uh, the, the PC culture God. I hate to break it to you, but it's just not true. Luke chapter 19 and verse 37, there's this story of Jesus going around and performing miracles. And it starts off by saying this, when he came near to the place where the road goes down at the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began to joyfully praise God with loud voices, shouts for all the miracles that they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in the heavens and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said, Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. They're too loud. They're making me uncomfortable. Silence your people. Tell them to hush. Jesus said, I'll tell you this right now. If they hush, the rocks are going to start crying out where I'm walking. The very place that I'm standing on is going to start raising up worship if my people are silent. Here's the thing I love about that scripture about the rocks because it points back to everything made by God was made for the worship and the glory of God. But here's what's interesting there about the rocks. The rocks did not have to be coached into worship. They do it because he made them. They do it because they are created and they're pointing back to their creator and said, I wouldn't even be able to be a rock. I wouldn't even know what a rock was, let alone know I am one, had it not been for my glorious creator. We are the only creatures in all of humanity that have the option to a deeper relationship with God than rocks, and we also are the only creatures that refuse it for the sake of comfort. I'm not trying to be hard on y'all. I'm just giving it to you. Look, this was on me before it was ever on you. We refuse to worship God and to walk further into his kingdom for the sake of comfort and then have the audacity to wonder why we can't feel the presence of God. Help us, Lord. Open our eyes, God, to see that you have made us. Hear me. Throughout all of the Psalms, we see this thought come to the forefront that all things created by God were made for God and specifically were made to point back to or praise his glorious nature we worship because of who we are we worship because we are as the psalmist says created by him to be his people we worship because we are his and it's what we were made to do it's the greatest purpose of your identity to point back to the glorious nature of your god I also noticed something else here in this scripture. It calls a sheep. <clears throat> that word sheep is used about 500 times in the Bible, give or take however much the actual number is. And a good portion of those, if it ain't God, hang it up. A good portion of those, I'm just playing. I've just always wanted to say that if the phone rang during service. <laughs> Don't trip. He ain't through with me yet, y'all. I notice also about 50 or 60 times throughout the Bible of him using this word sheep, he also calls us sheep. Here's some fun facts about sheep. Y'all ready? They are not smart. 
if I, if I were to to tier level animal, I grew up in the sticks of Harnett County. If I were to tier level stupid animals, it goes chickens, my dog Gus, and sheep, and goats are somewhere interchangeable with chickens. Sheep are not smart. They're also hyper susceptible to prey that come their way. They are highly susceptible to getting lost. That's a sermon all by itself. In fact, they are altogether directionless. They don't really have an aim or a purpose. They just kind of do stuff. Sheep are in need inherently of a savior, of a shepherd. And apart from one, they're in a very dangerous world. The good news is, you got one. The psalmist goes on to say, it is he who has made us, we are his, we are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. This is a reason to worship. Because he could still choose to be your God and not choose to reveal himself as your shepherd. Another issue that seems to hinder our worship from time to time, it hinders mine, is this level of entitlement. That for some reason, because God made us, he owes us something because we're created. God is God. God is God, is God, is God, is God, is God, and on and on until the truth sits well. God is God. If he chose today that, you know what, I'm done with all of humanity. Everything that I initially set up, I'm just done with. I'm done with it. Hey, he's done it before. Hey, I'm done with this. This is just not going the way that I thought it should. I'm, 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 I'm out and just, you know, Thanos snap level, we're all gone. He is completely justified to do so. The thing that causes me to worship about this truth of who he is, is it points to who I am. He's not a shepherd without sheep. God doesn't have to choose to reveal himself as redeemer, as provider, as father, as friend. He could be God and God alone, and that's enough reason for us to worship. But what he does is he doesn't just say, and I am your shepherd. He draws us into this intimate relationship and says, and you are my sheep, and you are my people. People, that means something to me, because that's that's slang term that I use, right? Right? Somebody being my people means I can call them at 2 o'clock in the morning and they're there for me. You, you just, you know, I can call you. You just don't answer your phone. It ain't your fault. I love you, brother. <laughs> Pastor Matthew was, was spending his whole weekend cleaning up trash for me. And I know, I know he could have. I know because I called him and he said, hey, I can't help you move. But what I can do is I got this hour. What do you need? That's my people. I got a relationship with that. Isn't it wild to you? That God does not just call you his children or his creation or putty in his hand. He said, those are my folks. Those are my people. Those are my friends. Those are my homies. Those are the ones that I draw near to me and say, if I need to have conversations, if I want to have conversations, I choose to step down into creation and do it with them. That's crazy. That's a crazy thing. We worship because of who we are. God is so good to me. That's why he's good. True identity will always conjure up true worship. Because when we know who we are, when we know who we are initially as broken people, but then we know that he calls us sons and daughters and sheep and brothers and friends, it does something worthy of praise, worthy of that shout of joy, worthy of that song of gladness that the psalmist was writing here. And all of a sudden, when we start to read this thing back in light of these truth statements that are sitting here, it starts to make a little bit more sense. At least it does to me. I hope this is making sense to y'all this morning. We worship him because of who he is, and we worship him because of who we are to him. Third thing here, and then I'm done, I promise. Well, I don't promise, but I'm going to try. We worship God because his love endures forever. This one's going to get a little crazy. Hold on to your seats. 
Verse 4 and 5 read like this. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good. And his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. The psalmist starts that scripture all painting the picture of a courtroom again. And we're in there looking at how we approach a king when we say enter into his courts or enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. It's the posture of the heart and soul. It's the culture of his kingdom. It's the only response worthy of something that is so holy. It's an audible bowing of the heart to sing these praises and to submit to his design. But that's not the part that I've ever had a problem with. What I've had a problem with is the for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. The Lord is good. Maybe that hasn't been true for you this morning. There's a time in my life where I believed it wasn't true for me. How can God be good if he allows the things that he has allowed to plague my life? How can he call himself good when his creation so opposite times act so opposite to him? Why would the psalmist choose to use these words? But glaring right back at me is the question of by what measuring stick can I define goodness without God? Whose definition at that point am I choosing to bow to? The creator or the creation's? The sovereign ruler or the fleeting heart of mind and man? I personally found the answer to the God that is good that I may not have always believed is good in the rest of this verse, and that is that his love endures. You see, to endure is not the same as to be faithful. Faithfulness is a choice to a vow, right? Faithfulness means that I have tied myself to you and I'm going to do what it takes to hold up my end of the bargain. Enduring love means that I will choose to remain faithful no matter what the other side of that party chooses to do. There is no amount of weight you can put on that tension of enduring with God that will break it from his side of the field. So what that word endure means, or that his love endures, it means no matter how many times I have walked in here in my own doubts, in my own lies, in my own false identities, and trying to understand uh, who this God is, but really just grasping at my own pride, or how many times I've walked into his gates with negativity and gossip on my lip, instead of thanksgiving and praise, he is faithful to hold up his end of the bargain. He's faithful to still love me and still call me son and still call me his people and still say, I choose you and I will continue to choose you throughout all. And I don't know for you, but for me, that makes him a very good God that somewhere in his sovereign nature, he chooses consistently to the promise of being faithful and that his love endures forever, meaning no matter the pressure or weight that I put upon it, it can't crack, not from his side of the field. I want to close with this one. Let me get a little personal. Say, you can come on up so these people actually know I'm closing. Just don't play nothing crazy because I'll uh, preach for a few more hours. <clears throat> His faithfulness endures through all generations. Why not just say the word forever? What's the point of saying all generations? Here's the point. All generations points to personability. That means not just forever for everyone. It means specifically for you, your kids, your kids, kids, your kids, 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 your kids, 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 kids. kids. I will remain faithful and true to them. My love will endure for them. Can I be a personal testimony of what that looks like this morning? Is that all right? Going to anyways. Can't stop me. I got a microphone. A lot of you guys have been praying for my father. I really appreciate it. Truly, I do. He's doing a little bit better. He actually preached last week, post-stroke, post-radiation. He got in there. And you know what he preached on? The goodness of God. 
That's something. That's something in and of itself. <clears throat> but here's the deal. Before my father was ever the person you guys are praying for, the minister, the pastor, the shepherd, the good man I know, Satan had a plan for him. Y'all thought God was the only person that has a plan for your life? Sorry to disappoint. Satan had a plan for my father, and I don't know what it was in the spirit realm that Satan saw that scared him so much of my dad, but it started when he was born. You see, the first memory my dad talks about having was being left on a court step by his mother who had several other kids, and they took all the other kids with her and said, I don't want you. Specifically, you are unwanted. To then he go and be raised by whoever could take him in, relatives, grandfathers, whatever. His father, who is a good man, my papa, was just doing his best. He was a truck driver. And so all he had was, was that. That was the way he, he handled all of this. They all lived in one house. It was cousins and uncles and brothers and sisters living in one big house. And the only person that was funneling money back to that was my papa and one other person. So he didn't have an opportunity to be there as a father. So from the moment that my dad was here, the identity that was tried to be put across his head was abandoned. Worthless. You don't matter. So as he grew, that hurt grew. And as that hurt grew, he had nothing to fill it with. So he turned to a life of drugs and addiction and alcoholism and sex and every other thing you can name. My father was, he was out there, man. He was out there for real. Like some of y'all think that y'all out there. My, my daddy was out there. He was out there. What my daddy didn't expect is when he ran away from home, the only person that would take him in and allow him a bed at night was his <clears throat> grandmother my great-grandmother, my nanny. I never got to meet this woman. Can't wait to meet her in heaven one day. And here's the problem with nanny. She was a spirit-filled believer, filled with the Holy Ghost. And my dad tells these stories of how he would come in intoxicated and go to lay in his bed and let his high rise up in his suit and he could hear his grandmother praying in the spirit in the other room over him. How aggravating it used to be to him. Just let me get high, please. Just let me feel this hole. But Nanny knew. <laughs> I'm going to preach a sermon one day called Nanny Knew. My dad ended up giving his life to the Lord one day uh, in a church. And it was actually my, my great-grandmother that drew him there. And she stood up in the middle of service. This is a little too radical for some of y'all. She stood up in the middle of service and said, We got to pray over my, my grandson right here, right now. Because if we don't, I don't think he's going to make it another day. And my dad walked down to an altar and said, God, if you want to do something with a dirty old hippie like me, if you can, show up. If you're real, show up. Immediately, addiction was released from his body. My daddy never went to rehab. My daddy never did another drug. My daddy flushed all the drugs in his pocket. My dad had to turn around to the dealers and explain to them and, and Wilson why he doesn't have their, their drugs the next day. He's like, I got saved. And they're like, we don't care. What is that going to do with anything? My dad's life was forever changed, and he's been preaching for 35 years. That in and of itself is worthy of praise. Here's the thing, though. That's not the point. My father went on to meet my mother and raise four of us children, Marcia, Stacy, Joe, and myself. And without any of us tagging in or touching or having conversations about it or even talking to my father, each of us have grown up to work back with abandoned kids in some way, shape, or form. We're in foster care systems. We're in adoption systems. Me and Jenna have about 27 young girls and sons who call us mother and father just because they don't have parents in their life. My brother has been doing that for years. My sister has been doing that for years. My eldest sister has an adopted uh, daughter, and my niece Madison, who's been with us for over 11 years now. And I have, I can't prove this to y'all, but I have to believe that somewhere in Nanny's prayers, she sprinkled in something like, and God, there is a plan that the enemy has over William's life. A generational curse that is attempted to be locked. But Lord, I choose this night and this day to shout for joy to you. I sing praises to your name. Because you are God. 
You, the Lord, are God, and I am your people, and I am a sheep in your pasture. So I will choose to enter into your gates with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise. And I choose to believe that no matter what I'm seeing over this situation, that you are good and you are faithful and your love endures and your faithfulness endures through all generations. All generations. Hear me this morning. I am a living, breathing, tangible. You can touch me. Please don't, but you can. Testimony of what God's faithfulness through generations looks like. Y'all don't think those demons came knocking on my door? Y'all don't think the demon of addiction came my way? Y'all don't think that spirit of abandonment that was in my father tried to rear its face in me? But the Lord said, no, my love endures. I am faithful. So I don't know what you came in here to do today, but I came in here this morning to enter into his courts with praise and into his gates with thanksgiving. I came here this morning to worship the God who is enduring in love and is faithful forever through all generations. I came this morning to shout for joy to the Lord, for he is good. I came this morning to sing praises to my God, for it is he that has made us. I came this morning to worship the good shepherd, for I am his people. People, and he has called me his own. I am a sheep in his pasture. I came to worship him because of who he is and because I belong to him and because that truth will endure forever, no matter what. That's why I believe this psalm was written. It comes from knowing that God is Lord. It comes from knowing that if he is Lord, then that makes us his own. And it comes from knowing that those things will never change. So here's the awesome part of being, James, can you grab this for me, brother? Here's the awesome part of being the person that brings the word and also the worship leader. I'm about to switch hats real quick. You can't stop me. You're already here. <clears throat> As we sing and as we come and walk you guys in worship, communion is open to you. <clears throat> this is something I hope that you never forget is also a, 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 a proving point of worship. But there's a greater communion to be had than this, this juice and this bread this morning. And that communion is entered through the door of praise and worship. It's entered into the door of knowing who you are and knowing who he is to you. You can also come and give your tithe and your offering this morning. But what we're going to do here in this next part is we're going to shift into a time of worship. I hope and pray that you guys can never read that psalm the same again. Because I can't. But what I also hope and pray is that this has shifted your mind about what worship looks like. And I'm, I'm just going to say it as plainly as I know how. If the identity of who God is and the identity of who you are to him and the identity of that truth lasts forever doesn't change your heart towards worship, I'm not so sure anything else can or will. It will just be that repeated revelation over your heart and over your mind and over your life until you grasp what it is that God has for you. It's an entrance door into a relationship. Will you stand to your feet and get ready to worship with us? Can I get anybody in the house just to raise your hands for a few moments and just say thank you to Jesus? Can I get anybody in here just to raise your hands and your hearts and your voices and say, God, thank you for being my shepherd. Lord, you didn't have to be anything else but my creator, and you didn't even have to be that. But God, you chose to be. You chose to be somebody who steps down into relationship and have a proving ground with me through your son that your love is faithful. And it endures through all things and nothing that I can put or press on you is going to be too heavy for you to hold. Father, I pray that over this next song, praise would break out in this room in a way that we've never seen before. Lord, I pray that hearts and minds and lives would be revealed to you, God, and that you would do a work that only you can. 
But Lord, above all things, I pray that whatever the identity was that was placed over them before they came in would be erased and that they would understand that there's only two things that exist, that is truth. You are God and we are yours. And that's it. And that's it. And that's it. And as long as we have those two truths, we have a reason to shout for joy to the Lord. As long as we have those two truths, we have a reason to come before you singing songs of praise. Worship with us.